gamers, welcome to the official early guide for Old School RuneScape's third raid, The Tombs of Amaskin. There are several categories we're going to cover, including requirements, gear, invocations, and mechanics, so I will timestamp these down below if you're only looking for a certain piece of information. Quick disclaimer, this is still a very early guide, so the metas are not 100% formed, and Jagex is very liable to make more changes to this encounter, which we could talk about in another video, but everything should still be pretty spot on. When there is eventually a better guide for this, whether I make an updated one or someone else does, I will link it in the pinned comment down below. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a huge thanks to today's sponsor, Opera GX. Now, I've worked with them before, and I think it's a fantastic browser, so let me share some of the new features and talk about why I use Opera. The biggest thing for me is called Profiles. Now, this essentially lets you create a custom browser for any activity online, and as a streamer who regularly pulls up the browser and doesn't want to leak my personal information, this has been a lifesaver. There's plenty of other uses as well. You can clear your browsing data when you close the browser, that's called Rogue. And there's a profile for people whose PCs might not be the most powerful, affectionately named Potato. There's also a myriad of other customizable options, so give it a look. Another great feature is the GX Player. Now, for someone like me who is constantly listening to music, this is radical because it keeps all of my stuff in one place so I don't have to constantly be shifting windows. This works with Spotify, Apple Music, and YouTube Music. And as someone who also very much enjoys the aesthetics of the browsing experience, Force Dark Mode is a blessing for me. Some websites are not designed with this in mind, and Opera saves me the headache of opening a page at night and being completely blinded, so thank you for that. The last thing I want to touch on is the GX Corner. This is super sick. Opera actively searches out the best free games, the best deals, the newest releases, and the newest gaming news all easily accessible in one place. Now this has gotten me some pretty awesome games, so please keep an eye out for this one. Thank you again to Opera GX for sponsoring this video. If anything I mentioned at all piques your interest, use my link down below to download Opera GX today. Also be sure to check out the mobile app and see why I have been using this browser for so long. Back to the guide. Now, as for the requirements, there are almost none. You need to complete Beneath Cursed Sands, and that's literally it. Also, if you have a Pharaoh's Scepter, you can use it on the Obelisk here outside of the Pyramid, which will unlock the Raids 3 Teleport. Minimum stats are a little bit more complicated, however. The difficulty of this raid ranges wildly due to the Invocation system, we'll cover that a little bit more, but at Total Entry Mode, I would recommend around base 75 combats. For Normal Mode, I would air closer to 85, and for Expert, you should have near max. Goes without saying that Rigor and piety help an immense amount. Now, it's time to talk gear, which is a bit of a contentious subject. There's still a lot up in the air, but I will show you guys the absolute minimum that I would go in with all the way up to complete max. There seems to be a misconception that you need a massive amount of gear to complete this raid, and honestly, that's completely false. You can go in with some very budget setups, which I'm going to show you guys now. Now, we know that stab is very useful in this raid, and melee seems to be a large amount of the combat, so I'd focus most of your bank value into that. Now, if you have a rapier or a fang, that is massive, but for budget setups, this is what I recommend. Weapons will be the most important component. The Kyrus Partisan is likely worth it for Kefri, along with either an Abyssal Dagger or a Zamorakian Hosta, if you can afford that. For the rest of the melee gear, I'd advise against Void in general, but if you have no other options, you can rock it. Uh, this is what I recommend for the cheapest possible setup. Serpelm is very nice and isn't really outclassed until you can afford Torva, but if you don't want to pay for scales, you can do a Nezi Helm. Fury should be all you need. Now also get a Fighter Torso, seriously, it's free, it takes like 45 minutes. Uh, you can camp Dehide Legs, we call that the Iron Man Special, along with D-Boots, Barrows, Gloves, all very standard stuff. For the range switch, I would recommend a Blowpipe, Assembler, Top Switch, and for mage, I'd bring a trident, a cult, an arum's top and bottom. Also, camping a brimstone ring is very likely fine here. For special weapons, you can bring a dragon crossbow for Zavak to have some range, but the blowpipe is probably better. For spec weapons, the DDS has some very sick potential. I even bring it in my expert mode runs for a mechanic on the Warden's fight, so pop one of these in the inventory. Now, for supplies, I go one combat, one range, minimum four to five restores, and the rest bruise. It's a pack yak inventory for sure, but it's definitely worth to soak up some mistakes until you get better at the encounter. Now, for mid-level, we can rock Bandos and the Serp again. Now, this is a decent jump in price because we are including the Rapier in this setup. The Blood Fury is really nice if you could afford it. Range setup has switched to Crystal and Bofa, and make sure you bring the Blowpipe as well in this setup. For Mage, we're rocking another four-way switch with the Sang this time, pretty basic, and supplies are similar to the first setup with Dragon Claws for their spec weapon if you can afford it. Now, on to best in-slot gear. Obviously, we are equipping Torva, and we're not exactly sure if the Fang is better than the Rapier, but we imagine at higher invocations, it certainly is due to stat scaling. 
You can also choose to bring a Scythe now, which isn't necessarily great, but it does have a couple useful points. Range is now the Tebow and Missouri, still with the Blowpipe, and Mage is, of course, the Shadow of Tumikin. Now, the thing with the Shadow is that you really need a lot of Mage Switches to make it good, and if you aren't super comfortable with lower supplies, I would recommend taking the Sang and the same 4-way as the last setup. Supplies are still similar, but with Sandfuse's time instead of a resource, since we have ditched the Serp. Now, as you get more comfortable with each encounter, I highly encourage you to bank a Brew and add some more switches. This is the setup that I'm currently taking to expert mode solos and teams, and it's working really well for me. Now, for all we know, these metas could change rather quickly when we get access to stats by and can really start theory crafting, but for now, this should all be good. On to the invocations. Invocations are really where this raid gets meaty. Invocations are modifiers to make the raid more difficult by either adding new mechanics or changing the way we interact with the raid. Every invocation is worth a certain point value or raid level, which scales based on how much difficulty it adds to the raid. Some add 5 points, others add 50, and at 0 raid level, this is considered entry mode. I would say this is probably the easiest raid, even easier than entry mode top. When you get to 150, this is considered normal. You can receive all the drops, and I'd compare this difficulty to a little bit below Tom, maybe around Cox. At 300, it's expert. This is pretty hard. Now, for every point that you scale the rate up, your chance of loot does get higher, but it also scales up the HP, the defense, and the stats of every monster in the raid. So, which invocations should you use? Well, that's a tough question, but I will give you guys some good recommendations and talk over the bulk of the invocations. But really, it's completely dependent on your goals, your gear, and your skill. So let's go down the list of invocations and I'll talk about which are whack and which are good to throw on. So there are really two types of invocations. The first half of the invocations are general ones that affect the entire raid, and the second half tend to be boss-specific mechanics. So off the bat, we have all of the ones up top which designate how many lives you can have in a raid. I personally keep Hardcore Run on because I think it's fun, it adds some spice, and it's 25 free points. If you're decent at the encounter, you can pretty safely put these on. Next, we have the time limits going all the way up to 25, which is really quick. 30 is doable but tight. 35 is fairly comfortable if you are good at the raid. And 40 is pretty free, so I would always at least have this one on. Next, we have the ones that affect the supplies. Now, since I take the pack yak setup, I'm usually okay with limiting my supplies a little bit, but only about by 66. 33 is really, really tough, and no help needed is absolutely insane. I don't recommend really ever using these. Um, on to the next, we have the path level up one ones, which I never turn these on. These aren't really worth it. They just add too much time, too much hassle to the raid for a relatively low amount of points for what they make you do. Next, we have the prayers one. I don't really ever turn on silent prayers. That gets extremely brutal at higher invocations, but quiet prayers is very manageable. On a diet is completely free. Just don't bring any solid food. It's pretty easy. I always have this one on. Dehydration. I don't recommend this one at all because you can't use brews and restores. And then finally, overly draining. This one makes all of your special attacks cost 100% special attack energy. Don't use this one, honestly. I uh, There's just too many places where having special attack is really powerful in this raid, so I would avoid this one if possible. Now, as for the boss specific mechanics, I say just play with these until you get them down and see what you like. However, some are much harder than others. The ones that I really recommend not having on are Mind the Gap. This one is annoying in teams. Upset Stomach. More overlords tends to be fairly annoying. Keep back can really mess up the raid. And feeling special, I would only say put that on if you are looking for a challenge. It's fun, but it is difficult. Now, all the way down here, we have the final boss ones, which in my opinion are some of the most fun, but probably the most difficult, especially in Sanity. So, uh, I, you know, use these at your own risk. So just play with these a little bit and see what you like. Now, if you're learning the raid, 150 to 200 is a pretty sweet spot without being too punishing. The good team, you can run some 230s. And 300 plus at this point seems to be more for sport. The loot scaling doesn't quite feel worth it, but Jagex may change that in the future. Anyway, let's get to the final section, the bosses themselves. Now, room order is not huge for this. However, I do like leaving Akka and Kefri for the second half. That way you enter the room's Assault and Adrenaline, which are essentially League's perks in the main game, but we're going to get to the mid-raid supplies soon. Now, starting with Baba, this is the room that I usually start with as my personal order is Baba, Zabak, Kefri, then Akka. But for higher invocations, you might want to save this for the second half when you have salts. Now, 
out. The puzzle section of this path is a wave style mini game and is honestly my least favorite of the paths, but it's still not bad, it's just a little slow. The general idea is that waves of minions come out while you have to coordinate with the team about the special mechanic that occurs throughout the encounter. For the monkeys themselves, there are the basic range, melee, and mage monkeys. You attack them following the combat triangle. So melee is weak to magic, magic is weak to range, and range is weak to melee. It's just rock, paper, scissors. There are three special types of monkeys as well. We have cursed baboons, which leave behind a trail of poison. I would freeze these immediately. At least one person on the team should have freezes. Uh, volatile baboons will explode when they're near you. I recommend you just pop these. Don't waste your time killing them. And then finally is the baboon shaman. I recommend marking these as you'll want to focus them ASAP because they spawn smaller monkeys. Now, the important mechanic in this room is called at Mechan's sight. One player will be given the sight, and every 30 seconds or so, one of three things will happen. They will see skulls on pillars, skulls on the vents, or the team will be highlighted red, called corruption. It is the player's duty with the sight to call to their team what the mechanic is. For pillars, everyone has to go repair a pillar with a hammer. For vents, everyone must pour one of the potions down the vent. And for corruption, everyone must stack up, and the person with the sight must pour a potion on the ground. Typically, everyone claims one corner of the raid and does their mechanics there. And overall, it's fairly easy. The boss itself is Baba, and I honestly feel like we're missing something with this fight. The boss is really tanky at higher invocations, but I will give the current meta in this guide. If it changes, I'll post it in the pinned comment down below. Now, small self-plug first, I do stream five days a week on Twitch. Come check me out at twitch.tv slash tastylife, and I would be more than happy to answer any questions about this raid. I really try my best to stay up to date with all of the newest information. For this fight, pray melee and attack with your stabby weapon. The fang is best in slot here, and occasionally rocks will fall from the ceiling, which you'll need to dodge. Soon after, Baba will throw a boulder at you, and you must be standing next to a fallen rock to soak that throw. Otherwise, you will take a massive amount of damage. However, not everyone on the team can take the same rock, as each rock can only soak a certain amount of damage. There will always be two rocks. For even numbers of players, you must split up half and half. Typically, we like to group up based on orb order, so the right side will take one, and the left side will take the other. For odd scales, it tends to be easier, because the orb side with less players will take the rock with a lower health bar, and the side with more players will take the full health bar rock. Now, this requires a lot of communication, and you must always be prepared to position yourself for the rock Throw. I'd say this mechanic kills the most people by far in this room. Now, Baba will also slam the ground, which will spawn a shadow before he does it. It's a fairly easy dodge. And also spawn baboon minions, which I recommend killing ASAP. If you don't, they open up the sarcophagi on the outside of the room, and they deal a massive amount of AoE damage. The final mechanic is rolling boulders, which happen at 66% and 33% HP. You're booted to the back of the room, and five boulders come rolling down. One of these will be cracked, and you must attack it to break it and make a safe exit for yourself. I recommend the blow pipe here. You can continue this until the boulders stop coming, or if you are super fast, you can make it to the top of the room and hit Baba with a melee weapon to end the phase. Continue these mechanics until the boss is dead. Next is the path of Scabarus, which leads to Kefri. The puzzle section of this one is quite literally six different puzzles. There is a Simon Says Memory game, pretty self-explanatory, then a guessing game with pillars, where you have to use trial and error to find the correct order to tag the pillars in. Next is the math puzzle, where you're given a number and you must use the symbols on the ground to add up to your designated number. The symbols correspond to 1 through 9, as shown by the chart at the start of the room, and after that is the light flipping puzzle. This is similar to a light box, essentially when you stand on a tile, it reverses that tile and both adjacent tiles. The goal is to turn every light on. You can also spend 20 HP to flip a singular tile. The final puzzle is a matching puzzle on both sides. You have to find each corresponding symbol on either end and activate them at the same time. After this is Kefri, which is a fairly simple but decently interesting fight. Now, if you have the blue partisan, I would use that. If not, you can use any other stab weapon. In phase one, you lower his shield to zero while dodging the fireballs that he throws. You will also at some point get the poop mechanic. You'll notice flies buzzing around your character, and shortly after, he will throw you to the edge of the arena and leave a wall of poop where you are, effectively cutting off the room. Now in teams, I like to DD on the west side for this, so you only get one line and the rest of the room is free to move around in. Otherwise, this mechanic is easy to screw people over with by trapping them 
them in a small area. Once the shield reaches zero, Kefri will spawn minions. I recommend focusing the spinning minion while praying range. I like to dump claws here, and then once it's dead, I equip the blowpipe and kill every single swarm that I can. Now, when a swarm gets to the boss, it will slightly recharge its shield. So the second phase will start with however much shield energy healed during the transition. Once you get the shield down again, another transition phase occurs, this time with an arcane scarab, and it's essential that you kill this one as fast as possible. If it fully charges, it sends out a ball of energy to every player that deals an immense amount of damage. I usually T-bow this, but you can melee it as well. Now, after killing it, you can either kill the melee scarab or ignore it and pray melee. After this, I get back on swarms until the next phase starts with all of the shield health that was regenerated. Now, bringing down the shield for a third time, you will see its final phase with its real health bar. The mechanics here are the same, just dodge fireballs, dump specs, and finish off the boss. Now that we are halfway through the raid, you will see your first helpful spirit. He appears again right before the final boss, and the spirit gives you three different options for supplies to take. There is one focused on life that gives you healing and resource supplies, one called power that gives you damage buffs, and one called chaos that is a mixture of the two. In here, you will see the standard yellow brew and pink restore, as well as a scarab that restores prayer over time, and bandages that restore health over time. The interesting ones are the buffs, including the smelling salts, which boost your stats to 120. 25. It's basically a cracked out overload, and you always want these. Also, we have the Adrenaline, which has your special attack cost. This is wickedly powerful if you know where to use it. And for the cherry on top, we have the Ambrosia. This thing is disgustingly OP, and I would not be shocked if it gets nerfed soon. If you have two of these things, I'm not kidding, you will have everything you need for the final encounter. You won't need any brews or restores at all. The Ambrosia overheals your health and your prayer to 125% from any previous stats. Now, there are is no attack delay since it's a potion and it is instant tasty from the future checking in here and they have changed this a couple times now so the ambrosia currently sits in the life section and at this point i'd say most players take the power option first so that they get the salts for the rest of the raid and then the life option second for the juicy ambrosia now the next two fights are my favorite i think they are nearly perfect Starting with Zabak, the big crocodile. In his puzzle, you'll have to pick up a water bucket and navigate through sepulchre-style agility traps to fill it up. And then you must traverse back and water the tree with said water. If you fail the traps or take damage, the water in your bucket gets reduced by half. It's fairly simple, just gotta do this one yourself and get a feel for it. And if you aren't familiar with pathway mechanics, I have a video titled, This is Why You're Bad at RuneScape. I will link that down below. It's a really good guide for basic RuneScape mechanics. Zabak is a super fun fight. Tebow here if you have it, but I've also seen ZCB, Bofa, any long range weapon will be good here. I also recommend BGSing if you brought one. Now, Zabak will alternate between mage attack when he throws a big pot in the air, and range attacks where he throws a big chunk of rock. You have plenty of time to react to these, just make sure you keep an eye out. He also has two main specials, the first one being the wave attack. He starts by covering the ground in poison and then sends out three waves in succession. Navigate to the clear parts of the waves while avoiding the poison on the ground. It's pretty simple. The next mechanic he has is the roar. Now Zabak will once again cover the ground in poison, but this time he will place three rocks on the arena. You have to kick the pots on the ground towards those rocks and break the pots when they get close. This will clear all the poison in a 5x5 area, which will allow you to stand behind the rocks and be safe from the roar. You must be within three tiles behind the rock to be safe, but if you mess up, you can run to the very back of the room. The first roar will hit you and push you outside the arena, so you'll only take one splat of damage and avoid the rest. Now in the final phase, around 20%, he enrages and begins auto-attacking very quickly. Dump claws if you'd like, just make sure your overheads are correct, and finish him off. Now this is fundamentally a very simple fight, but I think the flow of it is extremely smooth, and it's honestly just very enjoyable in my opinion. Opinion. Now for my favorite fight, Akka. I think this is a masterpiece, but there is a lot to chew on here. It's probably the most difficult of the demi-bosses, but I would also argue the most fair. Now the puzzle room here is a standard light puzzle. You just set up the mirrors and destroy any of the crumbling walls to direct the light into the opposite statue. You could bring your own dragon pickaxe here and store it. I actually recommend doing that. It does more damage.
Now onto the Akka fight itself. It's pretty radical and it does require all three attack styles. Throughout the fight, Akka will switch his overhead prayers and his own attack style, always protecting two at a time, so you must attack with a certain style and pray against another. Now luckily, the order that he switches in is always the same, so just remember the pattern. Upon entering, you start with pray melee up and attack with magic. After about a minute, he will swap, and you must now pray against range and attack with melee. The next time he swaps, you must pray against mage and attack with range. It's the same combat triangle we saw in the monkey waves, and you actually get used to it pretty quick. Just remember the pattern. The difficulty of this fight comes in when the other mechanics are introduced. The arena itself is divided into four quadrants. Now every 20% that you reduce, Akka will turn into a shadow and spawn four copies of himself in every quadrant. The team must choose one of these shadows to focus. Typically, people start on the northeastern shadow and then go clockwise for every preceding phase. Once you kill the shadow, Akka will then become attackable again, but only in that quadrant, so make sure he stays in that quadrant. There is also an explosion mechanic where every player glows white, and after a few seconds they explode dealing damage in a cross pattern. Now either you can spread out and stagger diagonally for the attack, or you can stack up on top of each other as the tile you are standing on does not receive damage. In a more coordinated team, typically people stack on top of the tank, but use your judgment. Now we also have the black ball mechanic. This time, the players glow black, and every tile they step on will leave behind a black orb on that tile. Now if you or another player steps on the orb, you'll take massive damage, so be sure to stand still when possible, and if you have to move to the boss, do so very carefully to avoid griefing others. The final mechanic is a Simon Says, and I absolutely love this one, the boss will stab the ground and teleport away. The four symbols on the floor will glow in a particular order, designating the order of safe quadrants, so just copy that and move to the next safe zone after the explosion. It's pretty fun, and it's decently easy. Now, once you get Akka all the way down, he will heal a little bit and go into his final phase. There will be orbs flying everywhere, which damage you if they touch you. These are extremely hard to avoid, so just focus on getting to the boss and using your claw specs or attacking with a scythe or whatever melee weapon you have. After a certain number of hit splats, the boss will teleport to a different corner, so you have to run around and follow him and try not to die to the orbs. It's complete chaos, and it's pretty fun. I recommend sipping the adrenaline at this point if you haven't and just dumping all of your specs. Boom. I done. Now, the moment you have all been waiting for, the final encounter. Make sure you grab supplies from the ghost, you definitely want assault if you don't have one, ambrosia is always OP, and adrenaline is nice for this if you have a DDS. Now, for phase one, you must kill the pillar in the middle as it charges up the two wardens on either side of the arena. Now, when they reach full charge, they do a special attack, and if they reach full charge at the same time, it's essentially a wipe. So, you must stand on either the east side or the west side, blocking the small energy ball and taking a little bit of damage in the process. This slows the charging of the side you are standing on, so the special attacks coming out will be offset. Now, there are four different specials. The red pyramids, which is basically an AoE damage mechanic, so make sure to avoid them. There are yellow pyramids, which damage the reverse tiles. And then there's the two energy ball attacks. The one from the east are giant red balls that the team must stack up together to avoid. And the west side are smaller, darker balls that the team must split up to avoid damage. Fairly simple, phase one. Now, an important note, if you do block the west side, the final phase of this boss will spawn Kefri and Akka to assist the wardens. If you block the east side, you will spawn Zebak and Baba. I recommend west side blocking unless you have the invocation that makes Kefri's bombs 3x3, because that carries over to the final fight. Now, phase 2, one of the wardens will spawn. If you've blocked the west side, you'll start by auto-attacking with range. The Tebow is absolutely massive here. The boss will alternate between mage and range auto-attacks, which are pretty easy to differentiate, and he also has a melee attack, so run away or pray melee and react to the autos if you're confident. He also has several special mechanics. There is a rooting mechanic, where the boss throws a rock at you and a shadow will spawn onto your player, if you don't move in time, you will be stuck to the ground, and it doesn't really do too much damage, but with all the other mechanics here, it can get you killed. There is also a lightning bomb. You'll notice lightning strikes around the main pillar, and then it will begin to throw out lightning bombs, indicated again by a shadow on the ground, which explode in a 7x7 seven seven area. They do a lot of damage, and they turn off your prayers, so be careful. Now, when you damage the boss fully, it will then fall to the ground and release its core. At this point, put on full melee, drink your adrenaline pot, and DDS spec this thing as many times as possible. You can get 7 if you are tick perfect. This will always max hit and multiply the damage by 5, so you'll chunk this thing, which is why the DDS is so extremely good here. This usually takes 2-3 to three cycles, so after the first core cycle, you're going to swap to your mage gear, and you're going to fight the warden again. This time, you'll deal with the same autos, as well as this red energy floor thing, which cycles around the floor in different patterns, and will again 
turn off your prayer and do a lot of damage, so be careful. Also, you see a similar prayer attack like in Ulm. The Warden throws out a giant red sword for melee, a white arrow for range, and a blue mage ball for mage. It smites you when it comes out, so just make sure to turn on your correct prayer before it hits. Once again, it will go down eventually, and make sure you spec out the orb or use your stab weapon if you are out of spec. Once you kill the orb, you'll be transported to phase 3. This part is extremely fun in my opinion, and I think the final boss is a great crescendo mechanically speaking, as well as a fun callback to the rest of the raid. The boss will smash the floor on the left, then the right, and down the middle, and you can navigate this by staying in the three center rows and moving accordingly. Now equip your Tebow or your equivalent range weapon for this and get moving. Periodically, he will spawn skulls throughout the arena and become invulnerable. Equip a melee weapon and kill them. You can equip any melee weapon and they all attack at a one tick speed here, so use that quickness to your advantage. Now keep doing this, eventually one of the previous bosses will spawn and use their auto attacks, so keep your overheads up and make sure you react correctly. After a few more cycles, the next boss will spawn and this will be either Kefri or Baba, which will throw bombs at the floor by your feet, so dodge these as well. Now finally, when the Warden's health hits zero, he heals for the final enrage phase. The floor will have lightning all over it, minions will be throwing out bombs and auto attacks, and the back floor tiles will slowly peel away, reducing the space you have to move. This is essentially a soft enrage because eventually there's only going to be one row of tiles to move on and you just won't be able to avoid much damage. Now use those ambrosias and dump your claws if you can and then just maneuver until the boss is finally dead. It's utter chaos and it's immaculately fun, maybe my single favorite fight in the entire game. Alright, did we get anything? Let me guess, absolutely not. Nope. Alright, what about a gem? Give me a give me a log slot. Give me something. <laughs> and you'd love to see it. 95k. Great raid, GG. That's it for the raid. I hope you enjoyed the guide. If you have any questions about specific mechanics, leave them down below in the comments or visit me on Twitch, and I'll try to get to as many of them as I possibly can. Thank you guys for watching. Stay tasty.